depending on where you are <laughs> joining us today uh, from. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank the History of Economic Society for putting together the virtual conference, given the circumstances. And I would like, uh, my name is Jessica Rodriguez Colon. I'm one of the presenters. I'm gonna be presenting the second paper and I will leave them to Laura Pajadal de Matos. Um, she will be presenting her paper, J.S. Mill and the Nature of Women, an eth Ethological Analysis of His Engagement with the Women's Cause. Thank you. Well, um, first I wanna present myself, I'm Laura. Oh. Uh, I'm a professor from the University of Sao Paulo, and uh, I've been studying Mill for a while, and this paper uh, intends to discuss uh, his engagement with the woman's cause from a viewpoint of his theory of human nature of character formation. So uh, we, the presentation will be around uh, half an hour since me and Jessica are the only presenters. And, um, I'm now I since English is not my first language, I put a lot of information in the PowerPoint so everybody can follow. Well, uh, as Jessica said, the name of the paper is uh, John Stuart Mill and the Nature of Women, an Ethological Analysis of His Engagement with the, with the Woman's Cause. Um, just as an introduction, uh, in the 60s, in the 1860s and the 70s, uh, there was a lot of discussion involving women, you know, they, they, a lot of debates on a series of uh, themes that involved women, uh, like on women's uh, right to vote, on women's the laws that, uh, marriage laws that, uh, that didn't let women to have properties or that they give power for them over their child, uh, prostitution, suffrage, education, you know, a very big discussion over the theme of women. And John Stuart Mill was a very important Victorian voice and he engaged like with passion in these debates and advanced a very critical uh, view about women's situation in the 19th century. Uh, as a public man, as an, an, a reformer, Mill was uh, a member of parliament and he presented a petition for women's vote. He was very, he gave a lot of um, public speeches on the theme of women, of especially enfranchisement. So he was very politically active in the, uh, defending women's cause. He fought for political, civil, legal, and economic equality between the sexes. Um, what I, this paper, uh, I try to, to, to argue that uh, a very specific view of human nature and of character formation uh, is underlying uh, this whole discussion about women. Laura, uh, your volume went out, but it says your microphone is still on. No. N 
now? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Where did it stop? Uh, Just a few minutes ago. Do you want to start at the beginning of this slide? Okay, I'll start at the beginning of this slide. Okay, thank you. Well, the, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so in this presentation, I will argue that uh, Mill's engagement with the woman's cause is very influenced by his view on view, human nature, a view that uh, gives a lot of uh, importance, importance to the environmental factors on the formation of human character. Uh, to sustain this position, I first, in the paper, I first analyzed Mill's pliable view of human nature uh, then I discussed the reforms that Mill wanted to uh, promote to emancipate women and to promote the uh, equality between the sexes. Uh, the third part of the paper, I examined the beneficial ethological uh, or character impacts of these reforms. At last, I indicate the specific roles that I think that uh, etiology plays in this in Mill's per perspective concerning women. Um, I don't really uh, develop profoundly the, the etiological part the, the, uh, in the paper, but it's important to know that Mill has a, a, a view that, char uh, that you have universal laws of human nature uh, like of association of ideas, and uh, the, the character, the individual character will be, will come from the interaction of these universal laws uh, with uh, the circumstances, the external circumstances experienced by in the, the individual. Uh, Mill uh, invents, conceives a science called ethology that would indicate the character that tended to be produced by any set of given uh, circumstances. And since uh, many of these cir circumstances are common to a nation at, at the given time, he talks about um, applied uh, science of ethology that would uh, give what character would uh, tend to be produced by those circumstances. Uh, so he, thought, he talks about a natural character that would derive from the, 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 these existent uh, institu uh, institutions, education, um, laws, and a lot of other uh, external cir circumstances. As a result of this view of human nature, this pliable view of human nature that gives a lot of uh, weight to their circumstances, Mill argues that the, in, the, in his system of logic, he argues that co the correct scientific procedure for the explanation of different features of human character would be to relate, to relate these features to the surrounding circumstances. The residuum alone, uh, when there proves to be any, being set down on the count of congenial predispositions. Uh, this is very important for my point here because what is he saying? Well, we can only say that it's natural what cannot be explained by the circumstances. And that, that's a view that he applies directly uh, in his subjective of women to discuss uh, and to explain the alleged feminine and masculine attributes. Uh, his great intention in doing that was basically to oppose a very common prevalent philosophical attitude that naturalized the differences between the sexes. Uh, in his words, laying bare the real roots of much that is bound down as an intention of nature and the ordinance of God. So he wanted to say, well, this is not nature, this is society. You know, what these, these uh, many of these features that are presumed as being natural are in fact uh, social. In relation to the gender difference of his time, he, he affirms, however great and apparently ineradicable the moral intellectual difference between men and women might be, those only could be referenced to be natural, which could not possibly be artificial. 
The residuum, after deducing, deducting every characteristic of either sex which can admit of being explained from education or external circumstances. And in the, the paper in the subjective of women, he goes on to explain several of the alleged natural feminine traits uh, with reference to the circumstances. He associates abnegation, submission, self-sacrifice, disposition to serve, focus on the family, lack of interest with, in the general problems of society, talent with practical things, intuition, nervous susceptibility, vulnerability. Uh, he relates all these alleged feminine characteristics to institutions, to costumes, to uh, such as the relation established, the very erratical and patriarchal relationship uh, established in marriage, uh, property laws, education, daily activities in which they engage, exclusion of the political life, social uh, expectation, education, among other circumstances. Uh, he also explains uh, the second rate performance of women uh, in science, philosophy, and arts by the lack of objective uh, conditions, especially of adequate training of time and peace of mind to exert these activities. Uh, here he has in mind the, the theories that, uh, that say that women are intellectually inferior to men by nature. And he's going totally against that view. Uh, the costumes, the, the, the circumstances, education, the family life also explain uh, several aspects of man's uh, current character, willfulness, overbearingness, self-indulgence, despotism, selfishness, self preference self fidelity and others that he, he numbers uh, that are negative characteristics uh, uh, of man at the time. He thinks the external factors are also uh, sufficient to explain the, better, the men's better performance in science and philosophy and arts. Also in this, in this way, contradicting the idea of natural intellectual male superiority. Overall, Mill believes that the current circumstances provide a complete explanation of nearly all the apparent differences between men and women, including the whole of those which imply any inferiority. Um, this analysis, in my view, reveals that the differences between the sexes uh, are such as may well have been produced merely by circumstances without any difference of natural capacity. The residuum, if it exists at all, uh, would be much smaller than usually thought. Um, It's important to see that in this explanation of women's and men's futures, uh, Mill gives emphasis to the social and thus changeable causes over the natural, biological, innate, immutable ones. Uh, in his view, the alleged natural attributes of both man and woman could be changed. Uh, and that's very important because these uh, supposedly natural biological difference were the foundation of many of the uh, of the different treatment that uh, and the subordinate treatment that society gave women at the time. Uh, so by this ethological analysis, Mill at once withdraws the scientific credentials uh, that justified inequality of treatment between men and women, since there are no natural difference, there shouldn't be social differences at all, um, and opens a wide space for social reform. Uh, and Mill wanted to reform his society. 
he didn't only want to see the origin of the roots of the differences existence between the sexes. He wanted to change his society and to foster equality between the, both sexes. Um, he obviously considered the current subordination of women as unfair and undesirable and wished to see it replaced by, in his words, a principle of perfect equality, admitting no power or privilege in one side, nor disability on the other. So uh, to change the situation, this unequal situation, uh, Mill proposed an agenda of reform uh, concerning women that aimed at modifying some important features of his society that he saw as being the main social causes of the uh, current subordination of women. Uh, he, he, uh, he wants to change the political exclusion of women. He wants to change the relations that were established in marriage and the laws relating to marriage and to married uh, women's property. He wanted to change the opportunities women had in, educate, in having a good education and access to the job market. So uh, I'm gonna analyze rapidly these reforms so I can go to the conclusion. Uh, in relation to enfranchisement of women, uh, that was a very important banner for Mill. He gave a great priority to the women's vote uh, and advocated the right of women to vote under the same conditions as men. Uh, he thought that was essential for women to gain voice in parliament and that would be the only way to guarantee that they, their interests would not be neglected as it was at the time. Uh, he believed women's vote was very important in itself because it emancipated women politically, but it would be very important uh, step towards promoting the other desired reforms. He affirms in this uh, respect, let us gain the suffrage and whatever is desirable for women must ultimately follow. Another thing he wanted to change were the laws of marriage and the laws of uh, property of married women. Uh, he strongly criticized the, the, the despotic power that law gave to man over his wife. Married women didn't have legal existence. They can sue, they can go to court, they can uh, have their children. They were totally incorporated into the, the legal existence of their, their husbands. They had no power over their children. They were incapable of holding property. And that's a very important thing, even when inherited or gained by their own effort. Uh, and furthermore, there was very, it was very hard to obtain legal separation and uh, the judicial system did not protect women, married women especially, against domestic violence. That was a very big, a big problem that worried Mill a lot. Mill proposed to put an end to the patriarchal relationship between, between husband and wife, modifying the laws of marriage and property of married women to give e equal civil rights to the husband and the wives. He says that was the, the thing that most shocked his contemporaries, not, not women's vote, but the, 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 the advocacy of having legal rights and civil rights equal between a husband and wives or men and women. He also advocated the possibility of separation on just terms, including um, incompatibility and happiness uh, as sufficient case for legal separation. But he thought these, these uh, changes wouldn't be enough uh, because uh, there was a lot of difficulty for women to make a living on, on their own. So he uh, also uh, defended education, uh, changes in education and uh, the opening of job market for women. Uh, at the time, education, women were less educated than the men and uh, received a different kind of education. Uh, 
the education wasn't as thorough, as profound, or as complete. And as a result, uh, education didn't pre prepare women to compete in the same terms as men in the labor market. Uh, John Stuart Mill uh, thought it was crucial that, we that girls had equal access to good education as boys. And this education should aim at their own development and enable them to enter the job market if they choose with the same qualification as men. At the time, there was a very common view of education of women that, that thought that women should educate, uh, should be educated to have, you know, a superficial view of everything so they could uh, be pleasant to their husbands, uh, have a good conversation, have, you know, have some interest in what they're doing, but they didn't have to have an education for their own development. John Stuart Mill's uh, definitely putting himself against that view. And the opening of market to women was also crucial. Even when they had good education, uh, prestigious occupations such as uh, medicine, law, politics, were uh, denied to women even when they were really qualified for them. As Mill affirms, they are either governesses or nothing. This was very uh, bad for Mill because he thought that this left few options for young men other than to marry. And after they decide to get married, they uh, uh, they were left to the total control and economic dependency upon their husbands. And there was an additional problem. Many women could not ha uh, find husbands. There was a demographic difference between the number of men and women. So that was a problem. What should these women do also? And widows that uh, didn't have a husband because he died and that couldn't uh, really uh, that they really had a difficult time in uh, surviving. So Mill proposes a lot of these reforms and he says, uh, and he uses astrology to defend them. He uses them as, uh, he, he tries to show uh, on the basis of his etiological analysis uh, that these reforms would lead to good consequences. Uh, so he used uh, uh, ethological knowledge as an ammunition in favor of these proposed reforms. Uh, he used this analysis to reveal the emancipating consequences of these changes and the extremely positive moral intellectual effects that uh, they would have both on man and woman. Well, enfranchisement of women uh, would be a powerful means for involving women in the politics and in the discussion of the greater uh, problems of society. Additionally, it would give voice to women's specific demand with invigorating consequences to all women. As he says in this quotation, women who vote will receive that stimulus to their uh, faculties that, and that widening and liberalizing f uh, influence over their feelings and sympathies, which suffrage self seldom fails to produce. Meanwhile, an unearthly stigma would be removed from the whole sex. They would no longer be classed with children, idiots, lunatics, as incapable of taking care of themselves or others and needing everything uh, should be done for them without asking consent. It would be a boon to all women. Uh, changes in the law of marriage and property of married women uh, and the consequent establishment of equality of civil rights uh, among the couple would also bring several beneficial changes in the character of men and women. With no territory for, existence, for exercise of absolute power, man's undesirable traits such as self-indulgence, egoism, tyranny, that were nurtured by arbitrary power would uh, greatly diminish. Women would become, in their part, less abnegated, submissive, 
uh, and willing to, se uh, to self-sacrifice, while men would display these characteristics in a greater degree. Family uh, life would become, uh, for all, a school, a school of moral cultivation. The opening of all professions uh, to women uh, and the provision of education that enable women to compete with men within these uh, professions would greatly expand the scope of women's available choices. Marriage would cease to be the only worthy uh, alternative on the menu. But even if women uh, decided to get married, Emil thought it was very necessary that they had the power to work, even if they chose not to. Uh, he says, this power is essential to the, digni to the dignity of women if she has no independent, uh, well, what, what, uh, property. Equal opportunities for both sexes in the job market will also uh, impact positively man's character because, in Mill's words, stimuli, uh, because of the stimulus that would be given to the intellect of men by competition of women, or by the, the necessity that would be imposed on them of deserving precedency before they could expect to obtain it. Uh, this increase of liberty of choice given by emancipation would have extremely positive effects on the uh, female character also. It would stimulate their moral intellectual faculties, would widen their horizons, uh, increase their public spirits and sense of duty, in Mill's uh, words, doubling the mass of mental facu uh, faculties available for the higher service of humanity. Additionally, once emancipated, women would be happier and more fulfilled. Thus, uh, these reforms would lead to the moral intellectual improvement both of man and woman and would diminish greatly the difference between the two sexes. Uh, there will, would al always remain, uh, regardless of the sex, the individual diversity of aims, interests, and values that uh, Mill so profoundly valued. Just uh, to finish, in summary, the argument of the paper is that Mill's ethological analysis was central to his stance in relation to the woman's cause. Uh, first, because it revealed that the current futures of each sex that allegedly justified the supermotion of women in society had no natural basis. They were social constructs and as such could be modified. Two, uh, it identified uh, social circumstances that were at the root or that reinforced the existing inequality among the sexes, and in this way indicated the institutions that were to be reformed if gender equality was to prevail. At last, this etiological analysis reveals the moral improvement both of man and woman that would derive from these reforms. And that way it furnished uh, ammunition for Mill's fight for equality and for the elimination of disabilities up imposed upon women. Well, that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Um, Jessica, I think it's your turn. Uh, uh, we're going to open for, for questions now, right? <laughs> okay. We're gonna have 10 minutes for questions for Laura, then I will present mine, 10 minutes for mine, and then any final remarks that can connect perhaps both papers. So the floor is open. Um, Laura, on the Q&A, you can read the questions. Okay. I'm curious as to why you're using the term mythological. Casually looking this up is designed as a study of human behavior and social organization from a biological perspective, yet, Yet Mill's advocacy of women's uh, rights for women is based on, uh, not on a biological perspective, but a, a, rather an institutional perspective. In particular, the debate uh, partners at the time routinely evoked biological arguments in favor of the natural inequalities between not just the sexes, but also races. Uh, 
Moreover, uh, the way you describe ethological analysis, universal laws of human nature plus circuses, costume and institutions. Um, well, uh, th does the, the question continue? I don't think so. Well, uh, I believe Mill uses this ethological turn in a different way because he, he uh, he invents the ethological science uh, to uh, basically uh, saying to see what would be the consequences of the environmental impacts over, you know, in the interaction of these laws of human nature, the the laws of association of ideas, how this would produce uh, the individual character or the the social the 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 national character um, in their interaction with uh, specific sets of institutions. So uh, I believe he, he certainly does not use in the, the sense of a biological determination of character. I, I think he uses the, the term in a different way uh, from the usual way uh, this term is used. He was going against uh, uh, Kant, uh, against Darwin afterwards that he was going against all these views that thought uh, that human nature, that nature was the foundation of the difference of, uh, between men and women. Not only the biological ones, but also John Ruskin that thought that women were different morally from men, superior, but uh, certainly he, he uh, associates uh, the character to the environment, and that's a very important point. Uh, another question. In my own readings of Mill, I remember thinking that his uh, subjects would be the poor uh, and the important of gi uh, giving and not really the rich of taking. In this, these lines, I would be curious if you have checked any other work by women about the challenges of the time and notice the any obvious but for mill subjects and tones about women rights i didn't have the opportunity to read other women's i have a, a graduate uh, a graduate student doing uh some research on that now what women would write about the women's position at the time uh, Rafael Galvão, your presentation made me think of what motivated Mill to defend suffrage. I might uh, enter in a question about Mill's biography, but his ethology seems to be advanced for the time. And did he suffer any sanction from his peers from defending his ideas? Uh, yes, and, and going back to the other to the other uh, quest for the first question, Mill defended also. I, I was about to write. I probably will write another paper talking about Mill's authority and race because it had very important implications also for race. Uh, like he he argues with Carlyle on what the nigger question. Uh, and he goes against uh, the governor's intervention in Jamaica. He, he has a lot of writing uh, in the sense of saying, well, the racial differences that we observe are from the circumstances that, from the environment that these, um, the black or the Irish or whatever race was exposed to and not to nature. Uh, this view of human nature gives uh, ground for him to believe that humans are equal by nature. Uh, maybe some differences, but uh, mostly all of the differences that uh, were observed could be explained by the external circumstances and not by nature. Um, uh, if he... Uh, if his biological uh, biographical uh, biography has anything to do with his position of suffrage, I think he, uh, from the start, he believes in the equality between the sexes. You have like in the 19, 1820s, he already talks about equality, uh, and he, but he obviously he married Harriet Taylor, and she was a very big influence on him on the the women's question also. And did he suffer a sanction? Yes, he, he, he was 
ridiculized in the press and with cartoons of Mill dressed as a lady, like jo uh, Mill joins the lady and he's dressed like a, a woman. And uh, he had, his reputation was questioned when he, he took these stands uh, in relation to women. Do I have time? Uh, Jessica, you tell me when to stop. Uh, dear Laura, does Mill have anything to say about the origins of the social structures that in turn produced sexual inequality? Uh, I don't know how about that, the origins of that. I think he, at least in the test that I, I read recently, I think he's more uh, worried about uh, the results then of what caused. I think he's more worried about changing the situation than of analyzing exactly what caused, I think like the relation between men and women force, men was stronger than women in the, you know, in the way back in history. But he thinks that, that uh, force in a civilized society shouldn't be the, the main uh, argument. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, uh, what else? Thank you for my apologies for confusing statement of the questions. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, in his etology about the novelist of character, uh, also speaks in, uh, about the novelist of character. How would this fit with his analysis of the role of women and their character? Uh, I think, uh, if I understood the question, I think he, he, he has a very pliable view of human nature. So, uh, what he uh, what he's arguing is that uh, several characteristics, noble ones and not so noble ones, are results of education, circumstances, marriage, family relation, activities. So if you change that, women wouldn't be more noble than men. Uh, they would have similar characteristics, and uh, but the emancipation of women would turn both women and men more noble, would improve their character, their, their character. Uh, uh, relations between equals are relations that uh, lead to improvement in Millsville. I think the asymmetric and power relations, I think for Mill um, is harmful for the power, the, the one that has the power, even more to the one that has the power uh, than to the one that doesn't have any. I think he thinks that uh, improvement, moral improvement would derive from equal relations. Only in that sense, both would be free, both would uh, be able to develop themselves. I think that's it, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. We'll have some time in the end if anyone has any more questions of my, my essay or um, Jessica's. Thank you very much for all. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Let me share my screen. Hi, everyone, again. Um, the title of this paper is Unveiling the Forgotten, Forgotten Voices of Female Thinkers rethinking economics. My paper is a little bit different in the sense that I'm gonna visit uh, some female philosophers uh, from different periods. I will present some of the arguments of female philosophers whose contributions were hidden for generations to tease the ideas that founded what we traditionally understand as economics. And as a result, what one may understand as feminist economics. The intention is not to argue against either, rather to step outside of classical economic thought. We will go back to the pre-classical concerns of economics. We will revisit some ethical ideas about what one may constitute as valuable. This will be to trace voices from the past, from the past that should be reviewed to understand our present questions about value that goes from the value of an individual in our present society to the value of a profession or the value of workers' labor. 
I intend to present that these thinkers had a, had a wider understanding of economics and governance, one that linked the private and public sp spaces, spaces that feminist economics link more often than the traditional economic model. Today, I will focus on how their arguments to value female-bodied individuals as intellectuals created a parallel argument to advance women into the governance of the house, into education, and into the public sphere. I want to invite everyone to take a pause to our preconceived notions of the historical progression of economics. Let us review briefly some of the progressions of women's displacement within Western society, particularly its legal displacement in regards to property and prescribed role for women within the private and public sphere. In doing so, I intend to showcase some key female thinkers to advance my argument. It is important, it is important to state that I will present a limited number of voices, not all of them, voices to whom that to my understanding had been neglected, voices that many will deny as influential to economics. I will review The Equality of Men and Women by Marie de Jarre de Grenet, The Book of the City of Ladies by Christine Pisan, Occasional Thoughts in Reference to a Virtuous or Christian Life by Lady Damaris Coutreau Macham, and An End to the Neglect of the Problem of the Negro Woman by Claudia Jones. I will review this text with the intent to question our ideas on governance and economics. The main question to be explored in this paper is, who are some of the earlier female voices that influenced political economy? Furthermore, how their voices impacted the economies, the economies of their present and future economies. I will argue we must look closely at Masham, Pisan, and de Gourney to deconstruct and reconstruct the way in which we contextualize the historical influences female citizens and thinkers have had in economics, politics, and political economy. I will further argue that Claudia Jones' essay is key to understand the historical neglect of the voices of Black women and how such had been undervalued in conversations of economics. Therefore, this paper refers to history as an academic field to constantly revisit narratives from the past, rather than as a fixed progression of events. Lastly, my aim is that these arguments will provide a new lens to rethink the role of female citizens. By proposing shifts in the way male and females contributed to the governance of the household, in education and the workforce, Lastly, I aim to trace these influences to our present economic, economies, the role of essential workers and the role of the labor of care versus that professions, versus professions of care. I will proceed to briefly situate our thinkers. Then I will present their key arguments and will conclude by threading their ideas to the pandemic present. Early Western thoughts, on property include the exclusion of women from governance and from the acquisition or inheritance of property. In Plato's imaginary republic, he sees certain women, elite privileged ones, as those who are apt for leadership. As such, he proposed a clear distinction between classes and the idea of the dissolution of property. Margaret L. Kinn and Albert Rabiel Jr. reminds us that early Roman law like the corpus of civil, of civil law around, from around 450 BC, influenced the ideas discussed by scholars from the 11th century, which inspired the legal systems of most of the cities and kingdoms in Europe. These laws aim to maintain and preserve property. It is through these laws that the concepts of patria potestas are introduced. It is here where we can pinpoint one of the possible origins of paterfamilias. This meant that this family's ownership belonged to the father and the definition of father extended beyond the biological parent and into the head of household, a male head of household. This created a clear power structure where the male had power over his wife, children, slaves, cattle, and land. In other words, 
These laws devalued other humans of the family as if they were a property of the head of household. If the head of household died, the male heirs had the right to become the head of household and all properties were passed to the new head of household. The aim of these laws was to exclude women from civil society based on property ownership. Later, during the Republican and, Empire, and Imperial periods, these laws changed and women had an option to keep property given to them by their fathers. While their limits continue on to other public affairs, their existence was valued only in the private sphere. Later, we see the influence of the Hebrew and Christian ideals where they promoted the place of women as that who gives life and that who provides care for her children and for her husband. The structure of the civil le legislation inherited from the ancient Romans was biased against women and the views of women on women developed by Christian thinkers out of the Hebrew Bible and Christian New Testament were negative and disabling. So how did these ideas form the views about the work performed by women? Well, women train their daughters on certain skills based on their social status. That ranged from textile skills like spinning, embroidering, and sewing, all the way to farm chores and housekeeping. But those at a, at, of wealthy families were trained on the managing of their servants all this being becoming unpaid labors. During the 14th century, professional female writers began to emerge. There is noticeable literature written by women, particularly devotional literature. There, there are numerous writings in the form of diaries or letters to their children and families. This next section will focus on the female role as presented by these female voices. Taken as a starting point, the question, what has been women's positionality in regards to their role in society? How had societies calculated the value of women in Western thought? This, we will start with the book of the City of Ladies by Christine Pisan. She published The City of Ladies in 1405. She's an Italian-French author and a political thinker who defended women's rights during medieval times in France through some of her writings. After the death of her husband and her dad, she became the sole economic support of her mom and her children. Such need led her to, the writing, to writing as a career. At first, she built a prolific career by writing love ballads, which cut the attention and support of wealthy patrons. Her strategies to support herself and her family with her writing placed her as the first professional female writer in, in Europe. In addition to those early ballads, she wrote several, ex several books exploring topics related to France's political climate. So in the, in the book of the City of Ladies, what she does is she creates the, uh, a fictional city, a city that it's completely each building and each part of the social structure, each, each and single layer, it's a different woman, the voice of a different woman from hundreds and hundreds of years that preceded her. But the book starts with her question. Why is it that so many men, lyrics as well as others, have always been so ready to say and write such abominable and hateful things about women and their nature? She was responding to uh, Romance of the Rose by Jean de Moon, where he reduced women's role as mere seducers, nothing else. So she starts from that point and, and introduce all of these different women. She presents details about how she explored the question, including her initial conclusion that women must be vile creatures, which led her to despise her sex. However, then she says how she shifted her question toward her faith, wondering how God could create such a vile creature. Through allegorical prose, she presents her arguments about the value of women in society by creating this city. As for the question regarding the value of female as parents 
and belonging to the private space of the household, it is interesting to see that one of the few moments included in Pisan, that one of the few mothers included by Pisan is Zenobia, Queen of Palmyra, whom she described as a lady of noble blood, whose parents obligate to marry the King of Palmyra. The moment that shifts, and perhaps what makes her worth including for Pisan, is the notion of being obligated or a duty, since Zenobia only slept with her husband for the full purpose of bearing children. Pisan portrays such action as a symbol of her devotion to the military service and to support the showcasing of her power and strength. Contrary to Nguyen's um, statement of mere seducers. The second part of Pisan's book, um, it's filled with examples of daughters who are faithful and courageous wives who exemplify virtuosity. While on the other hand, she mentions only a few virtuous mothers in the totality of her text. And we're saying like she presents around 150 to 175 women are the building blocks of her city. Um, and within those, about 30 are, were mothers, including Virgin Mary. While in the third part of her book, most of those virtuous women were female saints who basically renounced to their maternal love. As such, we can see an example of how early, even within the female voices, there was a stigma against a mother as a thinking being or as a powerful being, and a tendency to favor non-mothers as a strong female force within politics and in general within society, while sanctifying others. Now we'll move to Marie de, de Jardin Gournay. During the 1620s, she authored several books, including The Equality of Men and Women and Apology of the Women Writing. In both texts, she argues in favor of equal education for both sexes by delineating and defending the equality between both, extending her argument in favor of equal access to both sexes to occupy public offices. Grenet highlights the misconceptions of differences among, among sex and among women as an aftermath of the access to education by posing the question of whether one needs proof or not, to which she responds by posing another question, which highlights the difference among women from different countries and different social classes. One can see this as her awareness of differences expanding from the acknowledgement of other privileges as something that is socially constructed rather than biologically deterministic. Later on in 1626, when she published a collection of some of her prior writings, in the introduction, she starts situating the male versus female discourse within philosophy by forwarding a critique of the dualities presented by Aristotle as a way to prove that such misconception misconceived dualities had limited women to the labor of household care and child rearing. In equality, of, in equality between men and women, Gournay also argues that women are seen as subordinates due to prejudices by men, and that the apparent difference between men and women is really based on the dearth of education, educational opportunities for women. The access or denial to education is the reason to explain the intellectual and cultural differences between sexes. In this text, she successfully demonstrates equality among genders by incorporating different ideas into her argument, including classical, biblical, and ecclesi ecclesiastical elements. She states, quote, men and women are so thoroughly one that one that if man is more than women, Woman is more than men, end quote. While earlier, she also says that the human animal taken rightly is neither man nor woman. The sexes having been made double, not so as to constitute a difference in species, but for the sake of propagation alone. However, her statement is even more gets even more complicated at some point. She also states that the only thing 
which different, which defines difference as among human species is the rational soul. The complicated thing about this statement is who determines who, is a, who has a rational soul, which is also part of her critique in, her early, in here and in some of her other writings when she addresses the attempt of men to overpower women. According to Gournay, and based on her Christian morals, even when speaking about procreation, men and women are the same. She argues for equality of men and women, even when it pertains to procreation. Then what does she say about the mother? Although showcasing a series of arguments that support hers regarding the equality of men and women, she seems to be unable to escape the apparently inevitable idea regarding the functionality of bodies within it by stating, quote, which was likewise her function, end quote, when referring to the mother's body. On the other hand, while, um, while still following some of these arguments in the complaints of ladies, Grenet presents a direct criticism of the misogynistic tendencies of the era. In this text, she presents a stronger and more direct critique of the predominant ideas. Here, she acknowledges the privilege of men in a perhaps satiric tone, losing her Christian by, by the moderate exercise of which most of virtues are formed, end quote. This text is commonly recognized as one that incorporates sections from others to justify gender equality, including Plato, she quotes Plato, Aristotle, Hypatia of Alexandria, Catherine of Siena, and more. Now we will move to Lady Damaris Kutramasham, and we will notice how her argument, it's a little bit more contrary than Pisans and um, Gournay. Masham's arguments are in direct conversation with John Locke. Although not that many scholars have studied Masham's work, within those who have, there seems to be a general agreement that she was John Locke's disciple. Such agreement surges from three key elements, three key facts. One, the correspondence between the two. Second, the fact that Locke lived at the Masham's residency. And third, Masham's treatises where she cites Locke's work and expands on his ideas. From the beginning of the treatises, of the treatise, occasional thoughts in reference to a virtuous or Christian life, Masham argues in favor of the education of women for two main reasons. One, as a way to educate themselves in the Christian tradition and understanding of God's word. Secondly, to construct correct Christian values to their children. To support her argument, she presents that women should be well-educated. In other words, to improve their reasoning. Therefore, women should not be fooled in service of the family. She retorts, quote, the improvements of reason, however, requisite to ladies for, the, for their accomplishment as rational creatures, and however needful to them for the well-educating of their children and to their being useful in their families, yet are rarely any recommendations of them to men who foolishly think that money will answer to all things, do for the most part regard nothing else in the woman they will marry, and not often finding that they do not look for it will be no wonder if their offspring should inherit no more sense than themselves." End quote. She believes the role of the mother is to educate her child properly, and such standards include teaching them good Christian values. She presents that during her time, the social reality was for the mother to offer the care, the care and initial instruction of children until they attended school instruction. Therefore, the mother is the one who provides the foundation of knowledge for her children. So how does she de, um, expands Locke's ideas? Uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with Locke's work, you may remember that um, during the second treatise, 
he makes an argument for the equal value of the men and women in the household governance. And he uses the idea of parenting and the governance of the house as that of parenting within the house. So Masham says, no, what are you talking about? We, she takes then the biological predetermination and she says, no, we actually are better at this than men because we birth children, therefore we have the capacity. The problem is that you men have not allowed us to gain an education. So what she, she uses also um, John Locke's Treaty of Education to support her argument um, and the concerns of mothers without education. By concluding that maternal care influences both temporal, temporal and eternal happiness. The nature provided, that nature provided women with such cap capabilities by design and as such are innately better than men on the cares of the human life. We cannot say that Masham was the first one to critically engage with such discourse of women as a thinking subject, but she's certainly the first female philosopher to specifically identify the mother as a thinking subject who adds pedagogical value to the family, hence to society. Now, we will look at one of the, one other text. Now we will look at one of the forever questions within non-white feminist thought. Is it the value of all women or the value of some? Economics is not exempt from the racial discourse. On the contrary, such is quite at its core as for so much unpaid labor has been rooted on slavery. To help us illustrate the black feminist thought as it relates to economics, let us review some of the remarks made by Claudia Jones in An End to the Neglect of the Negro Women. Jones was born in Trinidad in 1915. Her family migrated to New York in 1924, where she fought against the Lynch Law. Although her formal education ended early, her education continued through her community involvement and activist work. The text An End of the Neglect of the Negro Women was published in 1949. Contrary to Prisan, Gurney, and Mich or Masham, Jones presents a woman who is a protector, whose responsibilities redefine our notions of care. She illustrates how black mothers became the guardians of their children, how they had the need to protect their own from the Jim Crow law, all the way to the lynching terror and police brutality. She said, quote, historically, the Negro woman has been the guardian, the protector of the Negro family. From the days of the slave trades down to the present, the Negro woman what has had the responsibility of caring for the needs of the family, of militantly shielding it from the blows of Jim Crow insults, of rearing children in the atmosphere of lynch terror, segregation and police brutality, and of fighting for an education of the children. The intensified oppression of the Negro people, which has been the hallmark of the post-war reactionary offensive, cannot therefore, but lead to an, an acceleration of the militancy of the Negro women, end quote. To this she adds that not only does black mothers protect their children physically, but that they also had no choice, but to participate in the labor market while being significantly underpaid. She reminds us that women's wages were less than men's, well, black women were paid half in comparison to white women performing the same job. She stated that the large portion of black women in the labor market is primarily a result of the low scale earnings of black men. Furthermore, black women are limited to the lowest paying jobs, domestic jobs, and their maternity death rate has, was triple than that of white women. Jones supports her argument by presenting some data from the 1945 report by the Negro Women War Workers. She summarized it as follows, quote, of a total of seven and a half million Negro women, 
over one over a million are in domestic and personal service. The overwhelming bulk, about 918,000 of these women are employing private families and some 98,000 employed as cooks, waitresses, and in like services in other than private homes. To this, she adds how the economic arrangements that provided some structure for each black family, formerly slave after the Civil War, created the foundation for the laddering of inequality between black men and black women. She states that, quote, the new economic arrangement, the change in the mode of production placed the Negro man in position of authority in relationship to his family, end quote. This was also extended to their churches, which since its inception also placed men as an authority over, over the family. Furthermore, this resulted in women and their children as slaves of their husbands, because in many instances, the law prohibited those emancipated to stay in the state after a certain date. Therefore, Jones reminds us that the only way for many black wives and children to remain in the state was to become enslaved of their relatives. Well, she also utilizes her argument to question how white chauvinist ideology had seen and displaced black women as, it, as that which is, quote, backwards, inferior, and the natural slave of others, end quote. As we approach to the conclusion of this paper, it is important to know that my work is situated among that of other feminist economists, whose work has expanded our understanding of economics and the biases already identified by neoclassical economics. Feminist economics continues to explore both formal and empirical models, which has contributed significantly to policy changes. For example, creating models that go from childcare costs to diaper and baby formula market analysis. As such, let us conclude by keeping an open mind to questions of unveiling. What does it mean to unveil? What has it been covered in the first place? By whom? Who places these covers over these voices? These are some of the underlying questions that thread these voices in this, space, in this paper. As we live through the experience of COVID-19 and continues the analysis of its effects on the market and the labor force, I invite you to keep some of these women present. Let us think about the differences between unpaid labor and the labor market and about the unsuccessful balance among both. Let's think about paid versus unpaid labor as it relates to our own survival and to the protection of guardianship of our communities. Lastly, let's have the ideas about accessibility and inclusion present as it pertains to education, slavery, including neo and pseudo slavery models and wages. Let's think about how we construct ideas of value from the monetary to unmonetary ones that lead us to place a price tag over professions of care versus the free labor of care provided by many caregivers. Let's think about essential workers and hopefully, among all, you will keep Claudia Jones present in your thoughts as you reevaluate the value of life itself. Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen and if there are any questions, um, I'll Okay, Jimena, um, thank you for this paper and for bringing to our attention these very interesting and pioneer thinkers. I would like to know how you choose the corpus you are working on. You cover a very long period, so I was wondering if you say specific connections beyond the vindication of the rights of women or making visible the situation of women between these authors and in connection with the history of economics. One, have you found any references to their works or do you know of economic thinkers that have discussed their texts? Two, is there, is there emphasis on the economic role of women or rather on the possibility of conceiving women as active economic agents? Or as you said in your conclusion, is there purpose or do they open the path of thinking and valuing care? Okay, so Jimena, <laughs> there's like, there's, that's a very 
<laughs> loaded question. Let me, let me unpack that. First of all, um, I began with this research as part of my dissertation. I dive into maternal philosophy and I create an alternative genealogy to that. One of the things that I found parallel to it is the value. How do we value women in the household? How do we value partnership? And how do we value or undervalue women as limited to the predetermination of bearing children? Um, as such, I am looking at other forms of economy and um, economies that are aesthetic economics. And, but then I decided to go more deeply into what they have to say beyond, beyond the mother and how that relates to our economic systems that have neglected um, in the past to include the female voice. Um, and with Masham, it was, um, it was interesting when I found out that she was actually a disciple of John Locke. And in my, uh, my more extensive research, I do go in deep analysis of Locke's second treaty and what he says about the parental relationship and Machan's um, refutation to his arguments. Um, in terms of, I have not found their work referenced in other, um, by other economic thinkers. If anyone knows any, um, please um, share them on, on the chat on the, or in the q and I do find their work um, cited in other philosophy or feminist work, but still mainly the, the three women that I mentioned. The most recognizable is Pisan. But Masham is rarely mentioned. Um, and Claudia Jones, she is highly mentioned within um, Black studies and POC studies. Um, do, and the last part of your question was, um, is there an emphasis on economic role of women or rather the possibility? I think in general, I, I want us to rethink the value of care labor, both um, unpaid as well as pay labor. Because even in the work market, we see that most of the pay, um, domestic laborers or laborers of care tend to be the underpaid ones and are the ones that traditionally most female participate in. Um, thank you. Let's see. Socrates Majun. Excellent presentation, Jessica. Thank you, Socrates. Um, two questions. What is your view that few women have won Nobel Prizes. Second, what should we learn from women as Anna Schwartz, Joan Robinson, Eleanor Ostrom, and Esther Dufault? Thank you for, for that question. Um, to my understanding, only Eleanor Armstrong had won a Nobel Prize in economics, um, but I, don't quote me on that. That was my understanding. Um, as for their work, um, I think certainly, particularly Ernie Armstrong, because it's the, the work that I'm most familiar with, I think they bring this idea of actually collaboration. There's something about the way in which their models are more inclusive of participation than just mere analysis, in my opinion. And I think that's something that um, through other feminist economics, I, I have noticed that they value both empirical as well as um, models, uh, more traditional models of economics or of analysis of, this, of the society before they go into prediction analysis. And I think it's interesting to see how women who work in, in economics or other academic fields tend to bring their experience and value it as much as part of the research and tend to consider the experience of the subjects that they study as well. Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the role of religion? It seems like it works here as both a veiling and unveiling. On the one hand, Jones indicates how church was wrongly elevated men over women. On the other hand, as you, your other thinkers show, religion was one of the few respectable spaces that pre-modern and early modern women could publish their writing? Thank you, Sarah. That's really interesting. Um, that's, that's one of those questions that I always wonder. Do they, really, do they really value the church or do they use it to the purpose of their, of their, of their learning? Uh, and and an, an example is, uh, it's another thinker that I don't use in this paper, um, 
but I have used in the past, which is Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz from Mexico, and how she became a nun to actually have access. And I mentioned it at the beginning, women, unless they were part of the church um, as nuns, they were not um, allowed to teach for many, many, many years. So even when I look at Masham's work, so I, I keep shifting. I'm like, is she really saying that we have to create this perfectly Christian children into the world? Or is she really using this rhetoric to convince men to allow them, um, to, to give them the right so they can earn the knowledge and the power to refute them in other, in other fields? Um, so as for Jones, uh, yes, definitely. It is, the church has, has been used in both, to veil and unveil. Um, like you mentioned, but I think mainly it has been to veil. Um, the unveiling, I don't think so much because even when we look at the progression, slow progression of churches um, and of certain traditions as to allow women to hold positions of power um, and later on as to allow women of color or women from um, underrepresented groups to hold positions of power, I think, I think we're still way far behind. Um, so to say that because women are using the church or, or their faith as a tool, it's a form of unveiling, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think they're actually fighting from within the monster, if we wanna vilify it, uh, of the church to have their voice heard. Um, if there's no other direct question, I will open it and I will invite Lara to come back in case anyone has um, questions, comments, or remarks for both of us. Welcome back, Laura. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Likewise. <laughs> any, any more questions? Questions or final remarks? Um, It's not a, it's not a very interesting that some people ask you about the, what women said, um, women from Meals Time said, had to say, because I was bringing um, some of these of this thinkers who actually preceded him. So um, that was something that it, it was really interesting. No, it was interesting that both talked about different things, but we, the whole theme, you know, matched no questions. Thank you a lot for both interesting talks. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions, then once again, we would like to, to thank everyone for joining us. We would like to thank, once again, the History of Economic Society. Um, and we are going to end the session for now. Uh, thank you for coming, and we'll see you virtually at other uh, presentations. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>